My name is Michelle Osson from University of Limerick and I'm delighted to be here at the launch of TAS annual uh, inequality report. Um, before I introduce the speakers, uh, I'd like to open the floor to, to Mike Jennings, uh, Chair of the Board of TAS, to say a few words. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Michelle, uh, and it, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I noticed that it started to rain on the way out, so you got in from the shelter anyway, so it'll be gone by the time you leave, I guarantee you. <laughs> so I think uh, most of you would be well aware that uh, this is one of our hallmark events in the calendar of task. The whole issue of equality, stroke inequality, is fundamental to everything that we do and have been doing for over 20 years now. Uh, in fact, um, we calculate that we're actually 22 stroke 23 years in existence, depending on the event that you mark as our first uh, mark of existence. And due to the pandemic, uh, that didn't get honoured until this year, when we were honoured in spectacular fashion by somebody of whom you may have heard recently, called Uktaran Heron Michael McGee. So uh, we had a wonderful uh, uh, reception from, from the President. It was a great honour to us, I have to say. We really felt it was exceptional. And people who were unfamiliar with uh, how uh, politics sometimes works in this country were just uh, really astounded that an organisation such as ours would get such an honour. And I had to tell them, I'm not a bit of stand for a wonderful office. <laughs> but it was great to have it, and those of you who follow these events in the media will be aware that the <coughs> President did us the further honour of making a controversial speech, which, which all, 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 all this helps. But coming back to today, um, as I say, inequality is, is, is part of our DNA, it's, it's very, very important to us, and so I'm really pleased to see not only the numbers of people here today, but the diversity uh, and the breadth uh, of organizations, interest groups, and um, pillars in society that, uh, that uh, we, we, we brought together in, in, in one room. So I want to thank you. Thank you for that. I would just like to say that um, I think you're probably all aware that everything that we do in task and everything that we aspire to do is built on the sine qua non independent, uh, sine qua non issue of our independence and objectivity. None of us who are involved in task hide our concerns with regard to how society should be run, the importance of issues such as deepening <coughs> equality, combating inequality, and furthering democracy in all its aspects. But for task, the way we serve that, those causes is by being absolutely committed to the idea of independence <coughs> and not being under the direction of any entity or any other uh, causes and so on. And we're very proud of that independence. But you probably know where this is going. Independence ain't cheap. Right? Mm -hmm. So we're doing an awful lot of work in task, and I, sometimes I wonder, I'm nearly afraid to go to the office because I feel guilty that it must be interrupting a huge amounts of work with all that everybody's doing. But we do an awful lot, very, very good work on a contractual <coughs> basis for good quality organisations who share our aims and objectives, at least in a certain field in which they're, and then they ask us because they know of the quality of the research that we do to conduct work for them, and we do a lot of work like that. But at the end of the day, that's not what task brings to the country, to society. What we bring to society, we believe, is this whole idea that we are in a position that when we have an event such as today, and the discussion such as I hope we're going to have, everybody knows that this is coming from a position where there's no hidden agenda or there's no constituency being uh, minded in any sense. And all I'd ask you to do is, and you clearly by your attendance here today, you've given us that support and we really appreciate it, is that we would like you to spread the word of our task and ask that anything that you could do to support the work we do, uh, and that you would consider. There end of the lesson.
Um, probably gone on too long already, but those of you who know me, comes, you know that that comes with the package. It's my Jennings after all. So I'm going to hand back to uh, Michelle, and um, I know that uh, Michelle was up before her breakfast this morning to come all the way from Limerick, so uh, well done, and uh, I hope you all enjoy the event. I'm sure you will, and the basis of past performances, I I'd imagine we're going to have a stimulating presentations and a good Q&A. So, Karimina Magov, of his fortune. Thanks, Mike. I'm sure when you mentioned uh, diversity, you're also including people from beyond the pale, so thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome our panel of speakers, uh, Dr. Rob Sweeney, uh, who's Head of Policy at Task, who's done uh, excellent work uh, each year on an annual inequality report, which is important, of course, to have it annually because we are keeping track of what's going on and, and what is impacting uh, trends on inequality and of course inflation is a, a big one this year in terms of topicality. We're also delighted to have two excellent speakers who will respond to the report and that is Kevin Cannellan, uh, President of the Irish Council of Trade Unions and General Secretary of FORSA. Uh, and Ray Lydon, Deputy Head of Policy, Monetary Policy at the Central Bank of Ireland. So we'll start with uh, Rob, who's going to give us a, a synopsis of the report. Uh, we'll turn to Kevin and Ray for some thoughts, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. So thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, Michelle. So the state we're in, uh, inequality in Ireland uh, 2023, the <coughs> report looks at a number of uh, aspects of inequality in Ireland. It looks at inequality trends over the last couple of decades, two to three decades, and it also looks at very recent trends, what's happened in the last year. Um, short story is that inequality has fallen significantly, many of you will be aware, over the last three or so decades in Ireland, but there has been an uptick uh, in the last year. Uh, we also look at um, inflation and how inflation has affected different groups in society differently. And some of the key points, as I mentioned, uh, inequality fallen, but uptick in the last, couple, in the last year. Uh, why has this been the case? There's less redistribution done by the state, a little bit. <laughs> um, there's no yellow submarines, um, but there is more market inequality in the last year, um, <laughs> and reducing taxation is likely to have adverse distributional consequences, as one of the uh, recommendations, I guess, or one of the implications, shall I say, that comes from the report. Deprivation has increased recently despite long uh, runfall and we call for some um, uh, increases in social investment, targeted um, increases in social investment in the near term. So, does this pointer work? It doesn't. So, um, trends in inequality. So this shows a number of measures of inequality where inequality is measured in disposable income. That's income after taxation and access after transfers, and it's disposable income per person in, in the household, so it's after um, sharing between household members. Now, the, the, the first line shows the 90 to 10 ratio, so that's the, the ratio of the income of the 90th percentile to the 10th percentile. The 90th per, if you're in the 90th percentile, it means you have more income than 90% of the population. So the nine, and similarly with the <coughs> 10th percentile or the 50th percentile is another word for the median or the middle person. And so when, when you look at the ratio from top to bottom, the 90 to 10 ratio in disposable or after taxes and transfer income, we see this uh, long term fall. Uh, we also see the falls when, when you look at the, the bottom two lines, that's the 90 to 50 ratio and the 50 to 10 ratio, although it's not quite as dramatic, but nevertheless at least from our perspective, that's a, a good story. So, some of the reasons why this might be the case. So this <laughs> here is a slightly different uh, measure. It's measuring inequality using the Gini coefficient, which is the standard measure of inequality. Zero being uh, a perfectly equal society, 100 being a completely unequal society where one person has everything. 
Uh, the top line there is the Gini coefficient or a measure of income in market income. So that's how unequally distributed market income, income before taxes and transfers, which is mostly income from work, but it also includes capital income. And then the bottom line is disposable income, similar to what we had in the previous figure, but now with a slightly different measure, uh, the Gini coefficient. And so the difference between those two lines shows the extent of redistribution that the state does. It shows the effects of taxation and transfers in reducing inequality. And we see, just looking at the market income uh, line first, the top one, what we see is that there has been a very significant fall in market income inequality since around 2011, so over the past decade. But really, this is, I guess, somewhat of a correction or, um, from what happened in the previous decade. So there was a huge increase, if you look at around the mid-2000s, mid and especially after the financial crisis, there was a huge increase. And so what's happened in the last few years is really just a kind of correction of uh, that steep rise that happened previously. Indeed, if you compare the first point and the last point, so the, the, the leftmost point and the rightmost points, 1987 versus 2021, they're pretty much the same. They're pretty much the same. And if you look at the bottom line, there's a, there's a trend fall so uh, over the last 35 or so years. So what this shows is that over the long term in Ireland, it has been the welfare state which has been key to uh, reducing inequality in Ireland. Taxations and transfers, it's not so much been the distribution of market income has become more equal, even though it has done in the last 10 years, but it increased in the previous 10 years. Okay, so what has happened uh, in the last year? So the previous figure is, is, is based on a number of, the previous two figures were based on a number of surveys uh, collated by researchers in the SRI. Uh, if I can draw your attention to this table, this is a, a table by the CSO, and it shows, um, contrary to the previous figure, that over the last year inequality has actually increased uh, a little bit. Uh, Eurostat shows uh, the, the same trend, and it's probably due to slightly different weighting techniques, but I take it to be the case if the CSO has shown an increase, uh, there has been an increase in inequality. So if, if you look at disposable income inequality on, on the box in the right hand side, there has been uh, an increase. Looking at market uh, inequality, there has also been an increase. So it went from 48.3 to 48.9. But it's not as big as the increase in disposable income inequality. So over the last year, the increase in inequality has been due to, number one, a more unequal distribution of market income, and number two, the welfare state redistributing less than what it had done previously. And if you drill down, I won't quite bore you with the details, it's not that taxation has become less redistributive, but it's rather that our transfer system has become less redistributive. Okay, drawing your attention to the figure on the left-hand side, this shows uh, what has happened to different deciles in the income distribution. So if I can just draw your attention to the line, for instance, uh, the blue line, its axis is on, on, on the right-hand side. The blue sh line shows uh, each deciles, each 10% group in society, their change of national uh, income over the past year, between 20 and 2021, which is when the most recent data relate to. So if I can just show, if you look at decile six there, that has a value of zero, if you're just reading it on the right-hand axis. Decile six has a value of zero. What that means is that decile six, its share of national income, or its share of disposable income, was the same in 2020 as compared to 2021. However, all other deciles saw changes, and just ignoring the top decile for a moment. If you look at all of the other deciles, the figures are actually negative. So decile one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, <coughs> nine, they lost 
they have a smaller share of the economic pie, of the income pie in 2021 compared to 2020. And if you look at the top 10%, a very large increase, almost 1% more of, net, of disposable income. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but that's actually quite a big increase. So why might that be the case? Well, we also, if you look at the bars, uh, that looks at um, changes in each group's income as a result of the withdrawal of COVID supports. So obviously we had lots of uh, supports, uh, POP, so on, and uh, TWSS, and those were withdrawn, um, quite sensibly of course, and then it looks at how each group's income, disposable income, changed as a result of that. So middle income groups, D4 and D6, they saw large negative changes in their income as a re result of COVID, uh, withdrawal of COVID supports. D1, the, the poorest group in society, actually saw an increase in their income, so that their supports weren't fully withdrawn, quite the contrary. But it's not clear from that whether it was the withdrawal of COVID supports that our uh, transfer system became less redistributive, but it's, it's something to, to keep in mind. Okay, and then, and then we looked at uh, inflation, um, and this is the rate of inflation between 2018 to 2023, the cumulative rate of inflation that different groups in society have, have faced. Uh, first decile being the poorest 10%, 10th decile being uh, the richest. And we, what we see is that lower income groups suffered or experienced the highest rate of inflation and that this has been due to, unsurprisingly, electricity, gas, uh, energy prices. But other things, rent for the bottom decile in particular ha has been very severe. If you look at the, the tenth decile, of course, everyone experienced uh, high inflation. Um, uh, restaurants and hotels are obviously more important for uh, wealthier groups, uh, given their different uh, consumption standards uh, basket. Of course, there's a number of ways that you can break that down. You can also look at renters versus mortgage holders, urban versus rural dwellers. So just breaking this down by tenure type and geography, what we see is that uh, renters, whether you're renting from a local authority or you're renting in the private market, they have also experienced a uh, very high rates of inflation. Um, Unsurprisingly, it's been due to rent, as well as, of course, electricity and gas. Now, poorer groups might spend more on electricity and gas, despite having smaller houses, perhaps because those houses are, are, are less well insulated. Uh, we also look at the deprivation rate, finally. Um, so the deprivation rate, for those who aren't familiar with it, is the share of the population who cannot afford two or more basic items. Uh, that are considered the norm uh, for households in society. This could include being able to afford two pairs of fitting shoes, uh, keeping your house warm, etc., etc. So over the long term, uh, deprivation has fallen as uh, living standards have increased, uh, although some debate over how much living standards have actually increased. But there was a huge increase in deprivation during the financial crisis, and that fell as we recovered from the financial crisis. But over the last year, there's been a sharp increase in, in, in deprivation. And that has been due to uh, people not being able to afford to heat their home, uh, basically, and also not being able to afford to uh, socialize with, with, with friends, basically. Um, yeah. so being able to afford socializing once a fortnight. So we do have a number of recommendations. Uh, we argue, and this has been picked up by the media a little bit um, today, maintain or increase uh, revenue. It's, it's not the time for tax cuts because we still have inflation of 4.9%, which is high. Uh, aside from other reasons that the state has become somewhat less redistributive, and we have lots of challenges into the future, whether that's climate, aging, what have you, and, it, and it's much easier politically to reduce taxes than to increase them, so it's never a good idea uh, in that sense to reduce taxes. Targeted support for those on low incomes, we still have ongoing uh, cost of living crisis, 
Um, there has been lots of measures introduced by the government which have been um, very good, um, but they should be a bit more targeted. IFAC, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, has made reference to the fact that they haven't been well targeted, among other people, ESRI as well. We also call for benchmarking <coughs> social welfare payments, benchmarking welfare payments to wages. And we also call for increases in the social wage. Um, I'm sure Kevin will have some things to say about this, but if, if you looked at the previous round of pay negotiations between the public sector and the government, there was calls for increases in the social wage. So what does that mean? It could be increased investment in childcare, for instance. And that would help reduce Ireland's high cost of living, at least in the medium term. Um, that would probably be preferable than trying to match wages with uh, inflation. Of course, there needs to be wage increases to offset inflation, but rather than trying to fully match it, uh, I think increases in the social wage uh, would, would be better. So that will help reduce uh, cost of living as well. Thank you. Much, Rob, uh, for that synopsis, and of course, I encourage everyone to read the report uh, in detail. Um, probably just a, a couple of uh, questions or comments, about Rob, that could, be, could flesh out uh, for the audience. But uh, where does Ireland compare in terms of its inequality levels uh, internationally? Yeah, so Ireland historically has had high levels of inequality uh, when you compare it to other European countries, other OECD countries. Now we're around the middle are a little bit uh, more equal than the average uh, European country and that's due to two reasons. It's due to the fact that income inequality has fallen in Ireland and on the other hand it's due to the fact that inequality has increased in, in the vast majority of um, developed countries due to a variety of, of reasons, basically a more unequal distribution of market income in, in other countries, uh, more wage inequality. So we've improved our ranking uh, significantly um, for, for those two reasons. Performance at home and under, you know, performance abroad in, in a different way. And of course, what's, what's uh, very clear from this and your previous reports for a task is the stubbornness of market income inequality. Um, could you tell us what, what's known and what isn't known about why that is? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a bit of a, a controversial issue, uh, basically. So, uh, Ireland has very, uh, if you compare us to other countries, it has quite generous uh, transfer system. On the one hand, it has relatively underdeveloped public services compared to what you'd expect for a, a northern European economy which includes very expensive childcare and relatively high rates of, of low pay, at least historically. So the conjunction of those three things, uh, transfers, um, very expensive childcare, and also high rates of, of, of low pay, does create disincentives to do work, uh, basically, or to do paid work, shall we say. So you have a lot of people earning little or no market income because often work doesn't pay. That, that's one factor. Uh, another factor is we have high levels of wage inequality, especially towards the, the top end. So we have high levels of what's called high pay. <coughs> Lots of people earning a lot more than the average worker. Uh, there's probably a number of reasons for, for that. Um, historically, um, we have had low or relatively weak uh, collective bargaining, especially in the private sector, which tends to offset wage inequality. Uh, we also have uh, high dependence on multinationals as well, so lots of very well paid tech workers, so that also elevates uh, market inequality. So uh, it's a conjunction of those two things, uh, wage inequality at the, at the high end and also um, lots of people who have been, I guess, excluded, say, from, from the labour market as well. And the last thing that is, uh, as you mentioned, in terms of the inequality trends, is the very long-term significant impact of the global financial crisis and the recession that we had 
in 07 and 08. And even though we had a strong economic recovery years later, you can see that that level of inequality took a long time to, to recover to some extent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, a lot of people have spoken about that our inequality performance is due to falling market income, and that is true in the last decade. But if, as I kind of mentioned in the presentation, that that is somewhat of a correction for a steep rise in market inequality over the long term, comparing 1987 to 2021, it's, it's the welfare state that has done most of the lifting uh, over, over the long term. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I'll pass now over to our speakers. Um, so I'll start with uh, Kevin Cannon for some of your thoughts on the report. Thanks, Kevin. <coughs> Thanks, Michelle, and thanks to TASC for uh, this event and for the report. Uh, I'm going to take as a given the instructions I got, which was to confine this to very short reflections um, on the document. And first thing I want to say is that, as the report acknowledges, our relatively poor social wage means that the heavy lifting falls to wage bargaining and social transfers to bring about uh, more equality. And it is yet to be seen the extent to which groups like the Labour Employer Economic Forum, which is a relatively recent body involving government, employers and unions, can grapple with these things. We've certainly put it on the agenda, but I don't think any outcomes there are going to be short term. We're talking about longer term, possibly some initiatives in the budget, but uh, longer term, medium to longer term initiatives. And the first thing will be, well, what, what does the social wage mean? And it, can there be consensus between uh, those actors around what the social wage is? Uh, one of the things I want to draw attention to is a, a report that TASC did for my own union, FORSA, you know, um, a report whose launch suffered from the um, fact that it was scheduled for the morning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And um, I know certainly uh, I was on my way into RTE to do Morning Ireland in relation to it. I got the call, understandable call, that uh, the item was being bumped. But one of the things that that report was seeking to do was to put uh, the challenge of change in Ireland in the context of building communities that would be sustainable and capable of addressing the challenges of digitalization, climate change, in a way that was socially cohesive by linking together issues of education and training, care in the community, uh, but also um, you know, doing it in a way where we made the transition, uh, where, where citizens would see that this was in their interest, that we could have quality care close to homes, close to families, uh, where we could have good jobs, good education and training for good jobs. And I think that when we talk about the social wage, we need to see it as in a fairly, through a fairly uh, wide lens. The next thing I just wanted to uh, mention was that, and like I think we need to keep saying this because this is what uh, people out there feel, in a country that is has buoyant uh, fiscal revenues, a lot of companies that are making very good profits. It's not unreasonable that citizens would expect their living standards to rise. And what we're getting at the moment is one excuse after another why that can't happen. And I mean, the, the, the next one that's already starting would be, well, we can't afford to kind of uh, prolong inflation. And I know that that was a kind of a theme in, in the report to an extent, but I think, um, the fact of the matter is, in circumstances where we don't have a deep social wage and where we don't have mature labour market institutions, I think the fact of the matter is wage bargaining is going to be extremely important. I agree and I think the interventions that we've seen over the last few weeks in relation to um, suggestions really, you know, of a populist nature that we can be cutting taxes are both simultaneously inappropriate, they're inappropriate in, in uh, 
in circumstances where uh, we're hearing that uh, the risk to corporate tax revenue means that we need to be prudent over the long run. Well, if that's the case, why would we be taking moves to reduce other uh, taxation heads? It's irresponsible because we all know that we need a bigger state. That's what the Forza Commission report that TAS did was. It was about the post-pandemic state. In fact, at the National Economic Dialogue uh, on Monday of last week, the one thing that was really, really uh, apparent to me was just how much practically everybody in the room agreed, you know, that we shouldn't be kind of uh, moving to splurge the, the, these monies. We should be trying to think through how can we actually, you know, come up with medium to longer term solutions that bring about more equal, e equality. And it's inconsistent because we have mixed messages coming from within government itself. Um, I think in terms of uh, then where people are at, I agree that uh, in inflation has impacted most on, uh, on uh, renters and on people at the lower end of the spectrum. It's also impacted more on younger people, I think. We have, um, in Forza, <coughs> we commissioned a major piece of research uh, conducted by Amorok where they surveyed our membership uh, towards the end of April. We had a phenomenal response. We had over 20,000 force members completed a very detailed questionnaire. And the data that's coming out of that would, would certainly say that people are struggling. It's not just, you know, it's now fairly uh, widely across the workforce that people are struggling with the cost of living. We saw under many of the headings that, you know, that's even worse for younger workers, so people under 30, people under 40, the numbers we were getting were, were even higher. <clears throat> so if that's the case, well, wh where do we stand in relation to uh, wage bargaining? Well, the first thing is that, in fact, from an unlikely source back at the end of March, posted on the ECB, uh, blo a blog post from within the ECB, you know, drew attention to the fact that the driver, the a bigger driver of inflation was excessive profit taking rather than uh, wage bargaining. And I think that that's something that um, we need to, to bear in mind. Um, so what type of pay deals then should we see in circumstances where we, you know, we don't have, okay, uh, Rob mentioned public se sector pay deal, but we don't have wage bargaining across the economy since uh, the financial crash collapse of social partnership in early 2009, we don't have that. And to be honest, there's no real desire for centralized pay bargaining on either side now, labor or uh, employer. But I think we should at least look at some of the things that, you know, our other countries, peers within Europe are doing. At the end of April, there was a very significant um, pay agreement in Germany negotiated on the union side by Verdi, the big public sector union, and a range of employers, covering immediately covering two and a half million workers. And it's a two-year agreement covering this year and next year. Now, it did come after very low wage settlements in 2001 and 2002, but it's interesting just to, to see how that's structured. And how it's structured is a 3,000 euro inflation compensation payment for everybody phased in with a lump sum of 1240 euro payable this month and an additional 220 euro a month payable for the next eight months so a total of 3000 euro and then on the 1st of march next year there's to be a 200 euro a month increase in pay so gross that up that's 2400 euro plus a 5.5% increase. So I think there is a number of interesting dimensions to that uh, from the point of view of responding to the real uh, you know, challenge that people have in terms of the cost of living. Obviously there's downsides from our point of view, but you can see uh, that there's an evenness when Rob talked about you know, the higher decile and the inequality there. That would certainly be a very uh, significant 
uh, change of direction. We've put, within the public service unions, we've pushed hard in the last two negotiations in 2020 and again last year for flat rate increases in the teeth of absolutely trenchant opposition from the other side until the, uh, the 11th hour, where we were told this was going to, the world would cave in, it was going to distort all relativities, so they wouldn't be able to hire people and so on and so forth. So I think if we were able to do our own version of that, and if the case was almost incontrovertible that, you know, taking something like that and applying it to the wide range of people who are delivering public services in our broader community and voluntary sector and fund, you know, <coughs> funding the ability to do that, it might also be an attractive option for the, the broader economy in a way where uh, at least the argument about um, you know, not risking or jeopardizing competitiveness in the longer run would be in some way addressed. So, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. A lot of food for thought there. Um, and next I'll ask uh, Ray Light from the Central Bank for his comments. Thank you, Ray. Uh, thanks, Michelle, and thanks to Bob and Task for the invitation to respond to this interesting and timely paper. It's great to follow Kevin because he always makes great points, but actually there's a lot of overlap in what Kevin says and what I say, and I, I certainly agree with a lot of Kevin's kind of points that he makes there. So I'll, I'll go through three kind of areas. I'll um, talk a little bit about the analysis of the inequality trends, but I'm not an expert on that. I just have a question for me for Robert, a slightly wonkish point. Second, on the inflation dynamics and distributional aspects, I'll give a little bit of a flavor of the Euro area narrative. So, what's the ECB narrative here? Uh, Kevin brought up one of the parts of their narrative, which is profitability <coughs> and unit profits. What role does that play in their kind of path for adjustment and adjustment of wages as we move forward? Finally, on policies, I, I pretty much agree with, with everything that's in the task report. The indexation of welfare rates to wages, I just have some questions there, and I'll pose those to you, to you Rob. So on inequality trends and metrics, I, I think you're right about, in the paper you talk about the withdrawal of COVID supports and how that kind of complicates some of the analysis of income inequality, and I think that'll take a while to wash out. So I just urge caution about the statement that inequality rose maybe in 2021, because there's a lot of noise in there. And I think we won't see that wash out fully for at least another year or two. Uh, on your analysis of the gap between labor market, uh, market and disposable income inequality. So, in fact, you brought it up in your response to Michelle. So, one of the things, uh, and you talk about it in the report, is workless households, but also low hours. So it's not just the extensive margin, but also the intensive margin. So I had a quick look. If you compare Ireland with, say, France, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, and you look at the ratio of hours worked in the top decile to the bottom decile, Ireland is the highest ratio. So we have a lot of people working very low hours right at the bottom compared to other countries. And I think that is probably part of that market income inequality story. Notwithstanding, I agree with also your explanations in, in response to Michelle's question. I think they're valid too. But I think it's important to think about, well, why do we have this low hours uh, problem or very low kind of intensive engagement right down at the bottom of the earnings distribution? I think it is related to, as you said, the way the tax and welfare system is maybe structured. There's kinks in the budget constraint that impact labor supply. I think it also comes back to the recommendations you have right at the end of the paper about childcare, so fixed costs of working. So I think there are many aspects there that can explain market inequality. Okay, on inflation dynamics and distribution, uh, slightly wonkish point, but you make it in the paper, I think it's really important. The household budget survey, which we're all using to make these distributional comparisons, is over seven years out of date. Okay, so that, we need to be really cautious. And I know I've done work in this area myself, but I, I get increasingly nervous the further we move from 2015 to 2016 there. I also think the dynamics of consumption adjustment to, to the inflation shock are probably underappreciated. But I think, and you do make this point in the paper, if anything, that could exacerbate the distributional points you make, particularly the low versus high income. I think there's probably more scope for higher income households to adjust their spending basket. You know, the typical example is going from branded to own brand. I think there's more scope for, for higher income households. So if anything, it could exacerbate some of the differentials. 
you call out. Rent, yeah, like the, you're right to call that out as a key issue. It's a massive structural problem, particularly if we look at like the census that just came out, right? So more than half of uh, population growth came from net migration, right? Most of them you got to assume are renters. If GDP growth is the product, is the sum of population or growth in the work, the, the work, the, the working age population and productivity, right? You got to see this as a drag on the potential for GDP to grow in the future. The fact that we have a very, very serious problem in the rental market. So to give you an idea, services inflation, which I'll talk about when I get into trends and, and the path also for monetary policy. Services inflation in Ireland in April was about 4%, 4.2%. Rent was over a third of that. Right? That is enormous. For the rest of the euro area, the share of rent and services inflation in April was 6%. So 33% versus 6%. That, that is excessive. Yeah, the, the rest, actually, the rest of services inflation in Ireland and April was food services. So there's a lot going on there, I think, the pass-through of energy and commodity prices still. And I think a point Kevin made about rent, which is really important, you know, a lot of Rob's paper is about uh, kind of income disparities, but Kevin's point about young versus old, that really kicks in in rent. And it goes right to the point Kevin made about social cohesion. That is not conducive to social cohesion. And it is something that is long overdue to be addressed. Okay, so I said I would briefly mention the, the kind of economic narrative that the ECB has. This is very much a euro area narrative. The ECB reduced, or released new projections last Thursday. And these are the projections that provide the framework, but also the path for, for monetary policies and the path for interest rates. So against the backdrop of kind of a weakening of growth, the ECB expects headline inflation to average 5.4% in 2023, 3% in 2024, and 2.2% .2 in 2025. So it's a gradual easing off of headline inflation. The Irish story is broadly the same. The central bank's quarterly bulletin will be released tomorrow, so you'll get a, a full update on that for June. In the nearer term, weakening of pipeline pressures from commodities, particularly energy, but also goods. But here, you know, the ECB sees a move away from kind of the supply shocks towards domestic sources of inflation, so they're quite concerned about sticky services inflation. I would say similar narrative for Ireland, and this is where uh, the debate about wage and wage pressures, but also profits, comes in. So let, let me say a little bit about profits. Uh, part of the ECB narrative is, you know, wage pressures will become more of a factor in core or services inflation as we move forward. But it's not a narrative about there shouldn't be a catch-up for the past surge in inflation. I think part of their uh, story and part of their expectation is that, yes, there were excessive profits, sorry, there were very high profits in 2022 as we came out of the pandemic. Not surprising, very high levels of demand, staggered wage setting. It's no surprise in that context that firms with profits would grow. We see that in the uh, gross value added data for the euro area. I've had a lot of back and forth with Rob, I've been able to show this for Ireland. It's not easy. But yeah, I think for the euro area, it's quite clear unit profits grew really strongly in 2022. Probably a similar story in 2023. A key part of the narrative for the ECB is, yes, real wage catch-up. So they expect wages to grow over 5% in 2023, falling to about 4% in 2024, back to about 3.5% in 2025. Not the same levels in Ireland, but a similar profile. So high this year, gradually declining. But a lot of that wage growth can and should be absorbed by, by the higher profits that we saw in 2022 and 2023. So what is the mechanism whereby that happens? Well, if monetary policy does its job, right, dampens growth, shifts the demand curve to the left, it makes it harder for firms to not have to absorb these higher wage increases through their profits. That's what we've seen historically, and that's what the ECB is expecting to see throughout its projection horizon through to the end of 2025. So a little note on labor market developments and my own area of labor market demand. So demand is very, very high. We see that in very high levels of job vacancies. They're still over about 40 to 50% above the pre-pandemic levels. There's some cross-sector differences. So we've seen a decline in some IT-related jobs, banking, legal, and other white collar. But it's a decline back to pre-pandemic levels. Okay, which was already a robust and very, very strong labor market. So it's not a case of weak demand in those sectors, but a falling off of the very strong demand we saw uh, coming out of the pandemic. On wages, so the wage growth tracker that I've developed with Indeed, which is 
tracks wages and job ads, so it gives a good sense of momentum in the labour market. Shows wage growth up to May, and for the first half of the year in job ads, around 45 to 5%. So very robust wage growth in Ireland. It's pretty similar in the Euro area. And what's interesting is it's very, uh, quite homogenous across lots of sectors. So it's around that range for all sectors. There are some sectors that really stand out. So I would say nursing, some healthcare. Childcare is a really interesting one. We still see very high wage growth in childcare. And some IT and, and engineering roles. Okay, so moving on to kind of the policy side of it. As I said at the beginning, I think the paper's comments around taxation and targeted supports totally agree. I, I would have no dispute with those. But one area that I think needs a bit more thinking, I'm not saying I disagree with it outright, but there are some questions about it, is this idea of indexation of welfare payments to wage growth. Right? So historically we know that average wages in Ireland grow at about 2%, which is the rate of inflation, plus roughly 1%, maybe slightly lower, uh, to accommodate productivity. You get cyclical variation around this, right? when demand is strong, it's higher, real wage growth. When it's demand is weak, it's lower. But an automatic indexation of welfare rates to wages means some explicit sharing of these productivity gains with welfare recipients. So I wonder kind of what are the implications of that, presumably high, high finance through higher taxes, right? In general, I could agree. So, you know, it's interesting to me, again, I'm not an expert on indexation, but when I looked at the kind of literature in this area, I saw that Norway and Sweden, for example, which do have wage indexation, I believe, but then they have an adjustment to remove productivity, so they have a negative adjustment downwards. So it's a question to you, Rob. What do you think are the wider implications of that? So there's kind of a general equilibrium story there. There's also a partial equilibrium story. We think about labor supply. So when the labor market is tight, higher wage growth provides really important labor supply signals. And we know that this signal is particularly strong in Ireland, where inactivity to employment flows are really large. We've seen that in the last two years. Right? Massive flows of younger and older workers from outside the labor force into work. So what does wage indexation do to these incentives? So I'm thinking about the reservation wage. That's a, another question for you. So, final point, the social wage, completely agree with, with Kevin's points here, and I've heard him say it for a long time. But specifically, childcare costs, again, I very much agree with the recommendations in the report on that. And I think childcare also has something to do with this low hours work, I said right at the beginning, childcare costs. ESRI have done really interesting work on childcare and labour supply. So they showed that the introduction of the childcare, national childcare scheme, was an 8% income transfer to lower income households who have children. So I think that is really interesting. This goes back to that kind of low hours uh, conundrum. The effects are really large. We know that the labor supply elasticity of uh, mothers in particular, but also parents of young children more generally, is highly elastic, so very sensitive to the financial incentives to work. So you know, what does childcare do for that? Or more reducing the barriers to childcare and the costs of childcare. And a last kind of slightly really high level question, work from home. Do you think this does something to kind of some of the barriers we see to labor supply in Ireland, particularly for parents of young children? So that's it. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, before I open to the floor, I might ask Rob just to respond to those questions. Um, <laughs> there's a lot in there. Um, I mean, I guess I was mostly in, in agreement, and uh, I think Kevin was mostly in agreement with me. Uh, I, I would agree that, um, oh, thank you. I guess just, just a comment on, on one thing Kevin said, that it was interesting that neither Labour nor Capital wants a return to centralised uh, wage bargaining. Um, and, and that's interesting. I'm curious as to why that's the case. I, I presume it's because, I mean, obviously we know why capital doesn't want it, but I presume why labor doesn't want it is, is your favorite sector by sector. Would, would that be the reason? Would it? Yeah, I think that's it in, in the main, but it's also, I suppose, a, a genuine concern that um, the 20 one years of centralized agreements weakened trade union organization in the workplace that has in turn obviously affected our uh, ability to bargain and uh, I think 
probably a greater number of unions would be concerned about, you know, the impact of a return to central bargaining. Also, the fact of the matter is that firms are in different positions of profit, profitability, so hence the, I suppose, the interest in more sectoral bargaining. But we're, we're really slow. I suppose the point I was trying to make that our, our labour market institutions are really immature and despite the fact that there is a certain amount of dialogue, we're not really uh, developing things to the extent required as fast as we need to, to respond to anything like this. You know, So the kind of initiatives, whether you agree with it or not, but the kind of initiatives that took place in 1987 that saw the birth of social partnership where at least there was an urgency is just complete, in my view, is completely absent now. And some of that, I, I think, is, is because of the political situation, both the kind of makeup in the Eruptus, but maybe more importantly, the fact that, you know, the makeup in the government. Yeah, I, I would certainly favour uh, sectoral collective bargaining. Um, so I'll, I'll just move to some of the things that Ray said. Um, Um, some of them very interesting. I, I guess he was mostly in, in, in agreement. Um, I guess I didn't say it so much in my presentation. I, I didn't make the distinction between uh, market inequality. I didn't mean to say that market inequality was primarily driven by people not doing any work, it, it, any paid work. Obviously, lots of people have domestic caring responsibilities and so on. Uh, yes, it, it's absolutely the case that probably uh, an even bigger contributor of high market inequality is what's called so-called low work intensity households in addition to uh, wage inequality um, and yeah a variety of factors there I, I know Kieran Nugent would have things to say about that he, he's done work with Miri on this uh, um, it's the structure of a welfare state the interaction between taxes benefits and wages and um, basically um, in terms of the inequality data, I mean, that <clears throat> over the last year things might change. It's true, but if, if, if you looked at the CSO data, there was an increase in the Gini coefficient from 27 to 28. Uh, that's actually pretty big. Um, and I can only go on what's available. And, and that's what the CSO says. And, Eurostat comes to similar findings as well. They have slightly different um, weighting scales for household members. Um, and then I guess he, Ray had most most things to say about my uh, recommendations, um, and specifically benchmarking social uh, welfare payments to wages. I mean, there's always uh, trade-offs. Um, one of the benefits of benchmarking to wages versus, say, to the general rate of inflation is that ordinarily benchmarking to wages um, is more redistributive. Okay, if, if you ignore the last couple of years, say, previous 10, 15 years, there was very little inflation in the economy. If you benchmarked social welfare payments to inflation, would have been very little in terms of increases in uh, social welfare payments, whether you're a pensioner and so on, even though the rest of society has uh, you know, seen increases. If you benchmark to wages when wages are, are, are buoyant, is this going to have uh, adverse work paid work incentive uh, effects? I, I guess it depends on where you benchmark to on the one hand. And uh, and also you also there's all of these trade-offs. Uh, if you did this in conjunction with increases in uh, childcare and the social wage that would encourage employment, you could potentially offset some of those adverse uh, employment impacts. So yes, it is true that that could be a negative, but you know every policy has their kind of trade-offs. And if it was part of a broader package, well then you can kind of overcome some of that. So I don't know if, if any of you have any questions or should we open it to the floor or responses? Can do. Thank you very much Rob uh, for that. So we'll open to the floor. If anyone has a question please raise your hand and we'll try and get your response. Hello. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Excellent series of papers. Rob, I want to talk about your one. On yeah, page time, seven, time. the first paragraph, uh, you talk about the silk data sets. And the most recent one has been seeing changes in, in, um, in, in the, so the definition of household and new sampling methodology. I think it would be quite useful to, to discuss that. But I'd also like to make the point, and I think this is fundamental when it comes to the, the silk data set as a whole, is it's a, it's a household data set. Now, I don't want to make a big point about this, but I think it is important. We don't all live in households. It might seem very obvious, but if we start to go and start to list the categories of people that don't live in households, the list is really quite long. It means all sorts of people living in old people's homes, all sorts of people living in prisons, all sorts of people living on the streets. The list is really quite endless. Or asylum seekers, refugees, travellers. It's a, an alarming long list which are excluded from, and as I understand it, even these, the changes that the Silk have done to their, 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 their most recent surveys. So I'd like your response to that. It was, this is an exaggeration, my point, but what is then we can make allowances that the argument is, I suppose, it's so hard and difficult and expensive to get data from those categories, and we have to be forced to have to leave them out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Kieran. Right, thanks, Karen. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment on the on the deprivation rate indicator. So, if you if you look at it there, it seems to be about the same level as in 1997. And I was just wondering what your thoughts might be on as as it was mentioned there. This is household level data and the, the changes in kind of employment rates over those 25 years and what that kind of says um, about the you know uh, distribution of earnings, etc. So. Obviously, since 1997, we've had a huge increase in yeah. participation rates of women. Yes. And more recently, I point out, I feel like a broken record saying this all the time, but um, since 2012, you know, there's more adult children living at home. It's, it's, it's basically doubled in Ireland, uh, where it's remained flat in the EU. So we got, yeah. even if you look at the older group, the 25 to 34 year old group, it's about 40% living at home now, and it was 20% in 2012. And over two thirds of those are now working full time, living at home, so massively increased. So that's obviously, you know, contributing to household incomes in a way that's kind of obscured when we look at, you know, the experience of individuals. So I'm just wondering what, what you know, if if we're not doing, if we're doing worse than we were 25 years ago, and way more, and we, we, we the the theme of uh, jobless households and and. and um, work intensity came up, but we're record employment in 2022. And we actually, if you look at the 2022 figures for jobs households, we're below the EU average. And if you look at the work intensity, uh, which recently we, we were usually, uh, you know, an outlier up until last year, but now we're, we're fourth or fifth. There's four or five countries with higher, and one or two of those are Scandinavian. So it's, you know, it's not exactly, for, from my perspective, it's not, it's, it's not explaining Ireland's high. Uh, level market income inequality, like the 2022 version or, or result for the S80, the, the share of the top 20% compared to the bottom 20% of market income inequality, um, we are still an outlier out of 27 countries in the EU. Uh, so I'm just, just wondering what you, what you, if you have any comments on that. Okay, we might take those before I move on to further questions. Just to the to, to the first speakers, I, I did get your name. Um, Jeffrey Cook is the name. Oh, Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the Silk survey, um, I guess if we had someone from the CSO, they'd, they'd be best place to answer this. I, I, I'm sure they make allowances because mm -hmm. there, there's various aspects, you know, hassle, there are various drawbacks to household, service, uh, household surveys, beg your pardon. Uh, one of them is, for instance, that very high income households either are less likely to yes. take part yes. or under report their income when they yes. do take part. And this can bias um, the, um, the survey. Mm -hmm. And the CSO do try to get around that. They don't only rely on the uh, survey, but they try to reconcile the survey with uh, tax records and so on. I don't know how they get around the uh, people, homeless, people living in prisons, uh, nursery homes and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they do, 
I would guess they tried to make an adjustment. But I, I would say that um, when you reconcile, say, the tax records, uh, again, uh, researchers in the SRI did this, um, when you reconcile inequality statistics as per the tax records versus the survey and try to make them like for like, the trend is basically the same. Um, and I don't know how it would affect um, so, so, so that's when you're basically with, with tax records, you obviously it's much more difficult to avoid your taxes uh, as a high income earner. Yes. Uh, so you, you capture more high income people with the tax <coughs> records. And essentially, when you reconcile the inequality figures per the tax record versus per the survey, the, the trends come out the same, if not necessarily the level in, in, in a given year. Um, so I don't know how it affects at the lower end, but I presume the CSO does things um, to try to account for that. Um, regarding Kieran's point, yeah, absolutely true that um, the 40% of, what was it, under? 25 to 35. But yeah, the 40% of 25 to 35 year olds living at home is, is, is a huge problem. Yeah. And uh, uh, an indictment of uh, policy, and specifically housing policy, if you look at people who are most likely to suffer from deprivation, uh, obviously people with disabilities, lone parents are among the top there. Another is renters. Rent renters are hugely likely to suffer from deprivation. Uh, regarding the, the low work intensity households that were no longer uh, an outlier uh, in low work intensity households, that's true. But uh, as you will know from recent uh, Twitter engagements, uh, we're also no longer a outlier for market uh, inequality either. So there is a relationship, but I'm not saying it's, it's the only one. Uh, high wage inequality at, at the high end is also a contributory factor. And, and no one's really done the work yet to try to kind of analyze, analyze that relationship. Great. Um, thanks, Karen, for your broken record comment. <laughs> Maybe a broken record, but you're right. Okay, and I'm, I'm glad you said it because it reminds me that uh, well-being is more about than just what this report is, which is about income inequality, yes. right? But and those figures are staggering. They are really staggering. But it, it goes to other issues as well, like wealth and wealth accumulation and wealth inequality. So whether we like it or not, wealth accumulation in Ireland is largely a property-based system. That's what the incentives are. Okay. Forty percent of that age group living at home. Yeah. How are they acquiring wealth? Both for pension and retirement. A whole load of issues that are building up there and will kick us in the arse sooner than we realise. Okay. So wealth inequality. For the central bank, from a financial stability perspective, you've got to think about mortgages as well. So you have many, many more people acquiring mortgages much later in life. Right? What does that mean? for financial stability, but also wealth accumulation. So there are really big issues that need to be unpacked. And I, for one, I'm glad you're a broken record on it, because somebody has to call it out. Thanks for your up. Anyone else with a question? Um, yep, yeah. so we have Nate down the back and the lady here in green. So, Nate. Thank you. Now, are from Age Action. I have two comments and a question. On, on the comments from, I think, one of the things, certainly from an older person's perspective, and I think for a lot of other people, is that there's a, a greater dis distributional effect of inflation through the effect on savings. So, for example, someone who had, let's say, €10,000 in the bank uh, three years ago, that's going to be worth €8,500 now in terms of spending power. So there's likely to be, I suppose, a scarring effect in terms of people's savings, which is particularly going to affect older people, but of course it'll affect anybody who relies on their savings for part of their income. So that's just to, to make that point. So you're likely to see, if you like, there's a bigger distributional effect from inflation than just the effect on, on income alone. On, on the point that uh, Jeffrey Cook made in relation to silk, um, I was at a meeting of the Department of Social Protection where we had a long conversation about silk because they were talking about the switch um, model that's used. And I happen to be someone who fills out the silk form every year. I'm on the panel to provide data. It takes about 90 minutes. Um, but they explain what they do. They triangulate the data you give them on the form 
with revenue records and with other records they have in order to work out the income. So when it comes to people on low incomes who may or may not find it difficult to spend an hour and a half filling out these forms, even with a person's assistance, they triangulate it against other data sources like revenue. So that's part of what you permit them to do when you sign up to filling out the, the civil form. So that's how they, they get that data on lower earners. My question to the panel is it relates to income tax. We had significant income tax cuts last year to the higher earners, um, which are likely to drive inflation. And the Taoiseach certainly has signaled his desire to further cut income tax to higher earners. To what extent are the income tax cuts drivers of inflation? And to what extent does cutting the higher rate of income tax effect effectively not only drive inflation, but create a gap, if you like, for lower earners, people on welfare, people on pensions, are going to feel the brunt of that inflation on their savings and on their incomes, whereas those in higher earnings are getting these income tax cuts. Thank you very much. Uh, lady in green. I, I just want to make a comment um, about the childcare wage growth. Um, there was an ERO, an employment regulation order put in pl place for the sector last September that was negotiated by um, the early years union, SIP2. So the wage growth, while it, it was brilliant, we came from a very low base of minimum wage. Um, the, net, the new minimum wage is 13 euro per hour. Um, or I'm actually next going up to the WRC to try and negotiate that to go up to 15 euro per hour. Um, and then with the National Child Care Scheme, it's been absolutely brilliant. I was working in the sector myself and um, it's been a help for, for households. However, once you go over 60,000 euro per year, you just get the universal, which is 140. And I'm finding because that is quite still quite low, it is um, preventing women from returning to work or returning full-time hours or taking that promotion. So I think while um, we have made ground on it, I think until we have a universal public funded model, it's going to just cause equality um, within employment for women. Thank you very much. Uh, was there a gentleman down the back as well with a question? Yep. We'll take uh, your seat. Yeah, I'd just like to ask about, uh, uh, you, or Rob, you asked for more uh, money for targeted supports. Would you mind just defining the difference between a targeted and a non-targeted uh, support and why you feel non-targeted uh, supports are not good value for money? And do you think that for political reasons, perhaps the government or maybe even senior civil servants prefer to spend money on non-targeted supports? Okay, thank you very much. Well, there's quite a bit there. So we'll start first with the question on um, savings and the distributional effect of inflation. Yeah, I wonder does Ray want to comment on the tissue response? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, savings, Nat, uh, yeah, I should have made that point, it's a good point. Um, income tax cuts in an economy with full employment, yeah, of course it's going to be inflationary. Um, Childcare, yeah, thanks for those points. Totally, totally agree, coming from a, from a low base, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and agree with your points about the, the threshold as well. I, I think there's a short-term path and a long-term path you need, you need to think of. Uh, I won't get into targeted and non-targeted. Leave that tomorrow. Thank you. Well, just, yeah, no, also on the, on the income tax uh, cuts, I, I agree, it will, will be inflationary. It's a tricky one because the distinction between indexation of bans versus what was at least being represented as some sort of, you know, bigger tax cut. I think, to be honest, I think it was more spin than in, than substance. The whole uh, thing that was in the papers a few weeks ago from the from the OTDs. but that that is a, a tricky one, but clearly inflationary. Just on on childcare and, and the point that clearly I think there is more that we can do to. Um, <laughs> increase labour market activation, particularly from women. I think that's going to be a big issue. I think something that we haven't picked up on, uh, but the reliance on migrant labour in some sectors is really storing up a massive social problem, particularly elder care, where we've a marketized, heav heavily marketised approach to elder care. Uh, and in other sectors of our health and caring system, like even just from the point of view of trying to manage that, you know, in circumstances where you have uh, such a dependence on migrant labour, 
when we have so many challenges in the first place where we have shortages of health and social care uh, professionals and other staff. Like it, it's under uh, reported, but in my view, it's going to come at us uh, like a train and it will have implications beyond just the services. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with both of those comments. I think one thing about the National Child Care Scheme is that it's only available for 38 weeks of the year, if I'm... No, no, it's available for all of it, so ECI, so the free preschool year is 38 weeks oh, okay. of the year. Yeah, but the National Etch, Child Care Scheme Okay, is, yeah, yeah. ECI versus, yeah, yeah I'm getting yeah. confused there between the two. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd absolutely be in favour of a publicly funded model like the, the Nordics have, it would require significantly more spending by the government. Um, w one of the tricky issues w with it politically is that if you looked at the exit polls in, in the last, <coughs> before the last general election, uh, the two biggest issues understandably were health and housing. Childcare was there but it wasn't uh, the largest unfortunately. Uh, because, well, I guess because most people don't have young children, so I, I think it will have to be part of a, of a broader package uh, of kind of more social democratic reforms. Um, targeted versus non-targeted, like uh, a targeted payment would be something which goes to, say, a specific group such as social welfare recipient. Non-target would be something that benefits everyone, such as a, a reduction in VAT or uh, energy credit. In terms of the, the politics of that, um, well obviously a non-targeted um, payment will benefit any, everyone in society, including say the better off. So if a political group, if their constituency or if their voters are better off, they're more likely to favour non-targeted sports compared to a political party whose political base is lower income households. So, I wouldn't say politicians necessarily favour one or the other. I'd say it depends on the political party, basically. And um, yeah, I, I think Ray covered the the uh, inflation and, and tax cuts already. So. Okay. Any more questions, Francis? Thanks. Uh, thanks very, very, very much. A <clears throat> couple, couple of points, just on the um, question central bar bar bargain. I, I can understand the re re reluctance and the historical experience. Exp Nevertheless, social partnership was broader than uh, pay bargaining for very good reasons. Mm. And I, th in my view, could be a challenge on this, but I think a lot of progress was made with the social wage uh, via the social partnership experience, uh, which included not just the employers and the government and the trade unions, but also civil society. And I think something has been lost in, in the regard to how we develop our public services in a progressive way by the loss of social partnership. I'm not nostalgic necessarily for that, but I think we need to find a new mechanism for driving the change. Uh, and I just wonder if there are any ideas um, in relation to that. Briefly on the question of targeting versus uh, universal. I personally am a, a fan of universal. Um, targeting, from my experience, creates all kinds of anomaly, anomaly up and down the scale because you have to introduce means te testing um, for targeting. And depending on how important the income is for the person who is being targeted, you, you can have people miss, miss, missing out at the edges and then you have to introduce all kinds of compensations to try and overcome that and so on and so forth. So and, and so far as we can move to, I mean, finished on, on this, the point is that child benefit is one of the most important uh, uh, tools we have against child poverty. It's universal. Anyone else? Okay. I'd like to comment on Prunchy's points. <clears throat> well, I agree with Prunchy's in relation to social partnership, and I think 
to an extent. You were kind of seeing that in some of the figures. I think that there were um, there was progress made. There's no doubt that there, from our point of view, there's it's there's a deficit uh, in my experience. What has happened since the crash is that we spent a few years as a country, understandably concerned with all sorts of terrible things and, and survival. The changes then that were introduced at European level were kind of very late, I think, being picked up by Ireland. Then the government realised they had to do something on social dialogue, so they set up a you know, uh, Labour Employer Economic <coughs> Forum in 2016. Uh, they'd argue that, well, there's the NESC and there's the National Economic Dialogue, but none of that comes close to you know a system of being able to um, uh, negotiate real changes. Uh, and look, it's a political problem. It's not a problem, I think, on the union side or indeed the employer side. It's on the, on the government side. And there's different, different kind of views, obviously. Had a conversation with Ingrid Miley, formerly of RTE, um, because I was being interviewed by her last Thursday, and uh, afterwards, over a cup of coffee, she said she reminded me of her first time reporting on social partnership talks, and some colleague kind of challenged her as to why she was bothered, kind of waiting outside government buildings or something. To which um, this is kind of against ourselves now. The story, but she, which she kind of uh, said. Uh, uh, do you realise what's going on in there? They're spending all of the money, and then they'll give uh, the doll a, you know, a bit of loose change to disperse in the budget. But the real judgment, I think, is well, which was better in terms of social progress, and which was which is actually better in terms of real democracy and social cohesion. I think we're we're now, unfortunately, in a position where, again, with good resources available. We run a risk that we're not going to channel them in the most effective way for the longer run, and uh, you know some of the kind of just the, the the kind of rhetoric about you know what was involved in social partnership um, really needs to be challenged because to an extent it was just used as a you know one of the things to kind of blame for <clears throat> other failings that really hadn't a lot to do with it. Okay. Can I um, Sure, please. So just on Prunchies' point, on targeted versus universal, I suspect, you know, certainly when the central bank governor talks about targeted, he always says temporary at the same time, so temporary and targeted. And I suspect, I, I agree with your point about the complications, about targeting and all that and the inconsistencies. I suspect the appeal to targeting is also a suspicion that maybe these things don't turn out to be temporary. So. Um, can I, is, are there more questions out there or can I ask Kevin a question? Would that be okay? So the, the Verdi agreement, the German agreement, I thought was really interesting. You brought that up and you talked about it a bit as maybe a path for us. Um, and you referenced their one-off payments. So uh, they were really very generous, I think, as you pointed out, over 3,000 euros over the period of the agreement. I think one of the debates, certainly in, in central banking circles, is do you think this builds up future wage pressures, particularly if the price level doesn't come down? So, so you know, is that a risk? And secondly, I, have, have you looked at other potential uh, mechanisms? So I was in France last week, and uh, they've introduced this really interesting scheme called the PPV scheme, which is an explicit profit sharing scheme, and it's aimed at SMEs. So um, it goes to the profit point as well that we've seen coming out of the pandemic um, so French workers can share, you know, in the profits of their firm. Uh, the money can be locked away, or you can have access to it, and uh, there's very strong tax incentives. So have you thought of things like that as well? Well, I'm probably not the best person to ask in relation to those kind of private sector ones. The Verdi Agreement was the public sector agreement, but one which I think will form a, a kind of reference point for a lot of sectoral bargaining in, in Germany at, at any rate. So what it involved was a combination of a... So they obviously set the kind of legislative process first so that they could introduce um, a the 3,000 euro payment, which is described as inflation compensation, 
that is tax and deduction free, phased in as I kind of explained earlier. But then the increases that are coming next year, and, you know, it involves a flat rate element plus a percentage element. They're normal increases that would obviously attract deductions and would be there on a kind of an ongoing basis. But it seemed to me that it was interesting because it was an attempt on the one hand to, I suppose, to contain uh, the level of <coughs> increase that would go on the base, whether, the, you know, uh, but at the same time respond to the reality that there, you know, people are suffering. So, um, and, and it, given that we have uh, public sector uh, talks this year, the agreement expires at the end of the year, I thought that it was a, an interesting idea that uh, is worthy of exploration. Yeah, certainly w when we analyse the wage growth, it's the flat rate and the percentage that went in, not the inflation compensation. Yeah. Rob, any final comments? Uh, no, nothing bad, I guess just to, to punch his point, yeah, I'm in favour of universal public services and so on, I, I was referring to cost of living measures when I was talking about targeted supports, the temporary ones, and maybe there are still those complications as well. But yeah, I, I'm definitely in favour of universal services and um, yeah. Thank you, Rob. Okay, um, so I'm sure I mean, we're, it's at a good point in time in the year for, uh, for TAS to be issuing support given the topicality of issues. I'm sure that today we'll hear more about childcare given the teacher's comments yesterday about uh, possible constraints uh, in the budget to contribute to, to childcare costs mm -hmm. and of course inflation and I don't, I'm not sure any of us want to be in government in terms of the policy choices and trying to manage short term demands and, and the long term managing of, of the surface but hopefully uh, task report can kind of uh, guide them in the appropriate direction. Uh, thanks everyone to coming, thank you very much to Mike, Rob, Ray and Kevin for uh, their time and effort and their uh, very insightful comments. And thanks also to uh, TAS, to Shayna Cohen, and to all the support staff we put uh, today uh, together, and to all the volunteers in TAS. Uh, we hope that uh, you can uh, read uh, the report on TAS website, and please keep an eye out for the forthcoming events. Thank you very much. Really interested in your efforts to the agreement. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like it's